folks, let's, let's, let's get started. So um, it's my pleasure today to introduce Mark Harrison, who's, who's joining us on, I guess, you're on sabbatical, what's the story? Um, all right, so he came up to, to visit us. He's actually um, a professor at the um, Department of Earth, Planetary, and Space Sciences at the University of California, Los Angeles, and he's in the neighborhood. Um, so he came up to give our seminar today. Um, Mark's got a variety of research interests that I think that touch on a lot of the research of people in this room. Um, he's interested in um, the tectonothermal evolution of continents in um, our Earth. He's also interested in the evolution of the Himalayan Tibetan Plateau, and I think he's made quite a name for himself doing research there. Um, he's also interested in heat flow and diffusion theory as applied to, to geological problems, and so the development of isotopic microanalysis. So, you know, a lot of the geochemistry people here, I think, work with um, things that Mark has been working on. Um, and he's very interested in the early Earth and the solar system. So, uh, Mark is probably one of the most more distinguished fellows out there. He has fellowships in um, the uh, American Geophysical Union, the um, Geological Society of Australia, and the Geochemical Society. And he's also a member of the National Academy of Science and the Australian Academy of Science. So, today he's going to be talking to us about a new paradigm for the early Earth. So, let's give Mark a really warm welcome. Thanks, Nick. In fact, you have given me a very warm welcome. I've had a fabulous time today. Uh, <clears throat> could have spent an hour in the offices of the folks that I talked to for half an hour. Could have spent two hours in Rick's, uh, Rich's uh, office. So I've learned, uh, I've learned an immense amount coming here, so I hope I can uh, give you something back. Uh, it, was, um, it was long believed, I mean, for half a century that the first Half billion or so years of Earth history didn't leave any record of its existence because its molten surface was being continuously uh, convulsed by uh, extraterrestrial uh, impacts. Now, such a scenario is hardly conducive to life, so it was also assumed for a long time that uh, its emergence had to await until the end of a period of intense bombardment in the inner solar system, termed the late heavy bombardment, thought to have occurred around 3.9 billion years. Now, more recently, certainly in the last oh, 15 years or so, thoughts uh, of quite a different uh, perspective have, have emerged, suggesting that early Earth might have been more similar to today than previously thought, and in the recent years, actually, that um, some skepticism whether or not this late heavy bombardment, this great planetary sterilizing event, and even happened. So let's... Um, Let's look at some uh, milestones in the evolution of life, called evolution of the planet and life. The, um, the orange block down here is uh, informally referred to as the Hadean, uh, roughly the first half billion years of Earth history. And I use the term to describe the period before which we have a rock record. Now, the, um, to suggest that, in fact, we have a continuous history through the last four billion years is, uh, is misleading. Uh, it's, it's a s terribly discontinuous, famously discontinuous record. Point out too that between about three and a half and four billion years, the rocks that we have identified have all experienced sig significant enough uh, intensity of metamorphism to, uh, to uh, almost certainly erase morphological fossils from uh, supercrustal rocks had they uh, ever existed. Now, all societies have origin myths. Talked with the grad students at lunch about this, and uh, some societies have multiple or origin myths. And I say, well, take, for example, mine. Uh, polls taken in this country over the past 50 years show continuously, it depends how you ask the question, but about half of American adults believe that the planet 6,000 years old and formed in the fashion described in Genesis verses 1 through 9. Now, at the same time period, <coughs> as evidence, this is a cover of Life magazine, the month after I was born, uh, into this millennium. Here's an otherwise good book by Warden Brownlee, telling us that for hundreds of millions of years, and other authors, you know, a, a billion years, there was no, uh, no stable continent. Now, it's funny, as, 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 as the story slowly changed with discoveries, um, some things remain constant. For example, in a rock berg in the Hidean has to have Two, two bumps on it. Uh, now, 
these two models I've described, the planetary earth sciences community and that of uh, biblical creation, the timescales differ by nearly a million, but I see them as intellectual cousins because they share this in common. There is absolutely, positively, not a single skerrick of evidence that requires that either of those scenarios ever occurred. And I think the moral of this is <clears throat> that when we talk about earliest Earth, that we resist speculation and, and base our arguments on tangible evidence. So what is tangible evidence? Well, there ain't much of it. Okay, grant you that. I think they come comes in four flavors. One of which is we can assume that physical laws are constant through time, so we can do some calculations, some simple calculations like what was the radioactivity like back then, maybe four or five times greater than today. We can do more elaborate calculations like uh, full three-dimensional high Rayleigh number <coughs> crust mantle uh, uh, models with 45 free parameters. Um, but nonetheless, you know, we, we can use this full spectrum of, uh, of, of calculation to at least constrain or at least understand whether a particular speculation is physically possible. Another is that mantle rocks, you guys are you know, world uh, experts at this, uh, even rocks significantly younger than uh, the Hadean Archean boundary, can preserve evidence, short-lived, long-lived radioactivities that tell us about global crust, mantle, silicate earth, silicate uh, metal, uh, differentiation events. Now, the, uh, the lunar surface, uh, about half of which we think is older than four billion years, uh, it's going to have an opinion about what it was like in this neck of the solar system in the, in the Hadean. So we, in fact, can look to it to get uh, some ideas about what was pelting down at that time. And lastly, these old zircons from Western Australia, I'll show you a picture in a sec, uh, this is typically about the width of one of the hairs on your head. These are tiny little guys found uh, <clears throat> in an outcrop. Again, I'll show you in a sec. Get back to that. But, uh, you know, they're terrestrial. No question about that. A vast majority are, are igneous and appear to have formed in what looked like granitoid melts. So what can these guys tell us about terrestrial habitability? Well, I'll give you a, a, a Mark Harrison primer on what I think uh, is involved. Classically, I mean, these 10 ingredients are, I mean, this is the broad kind of community consensus emerged over the past 15 years or so. You want to be in the sweet spot galactically, not too close in to get zapped, not too far out to have too low a, uh, a metallicity. You want to be in the Goldilocks zone of the solar system. You don't want your water boiling off close to the sun. You don't want to have a frozen surface, although you know, that may not be an absolute requirement. Uh, you want water at the surface to mitigate or mediate, sorry, the uh, Uri reactions, which is on this planet what we think is going to draw down the CO2 that's from vol uh, volcanic emissions that uh, otherwise drive you into a Venusian-like uh, greenhouse. Uh, we are a water-cold planet. You, uh, <coughs> you certainly are going to need something like the mid-ocean ridge hydrothermal activity to, to uh, uh, remove water. Oops, let me get back to that. Here we go. Uh, to remove heat in order to drive plate tectonics, which we'll need in a sec, and of course water as a uh, solvent for, for biomolecules. You want water in the interior, it's absolutely uh, cr crucial to lower melting temperatures so we can get magma underneath mid-ocean ridges to make uh, the oceanic conveyor belt to uh, assist with that recycling of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere back uh, into the solid earth. Uh, it's a great uh, kinetic <coughs> a catalyst to turn that basaltic crust into eclogite, which is, of course, the slab pull is the big term in the uh, mode of force in the tectonic, global tectonic system. And it uh, reduces the viscosity of the, uh, the upper mantle to enhance the internal uh, fluid motion, uh, again, to aid this, uh, this overall recycling uh, mechanism. A composition, you don't want to be uh, too metal poor. You want something you know, solid you can uh, build your, your colony on. You don't want to be too metal rich in the view of some uh, planetary scientists. But this is associated with uh, hot Jupiter, terrestrial planet killers. Um, and, uh, and in fact, you may in fact not want to have a magnesium silicon ratio much different than the one we've got 
So you've got olivine in the upper mantle. It changed that MGSI ratio by maybe 20%. We've got a pyroxene upper mantle. Eh, that's tougher to, uh, to get moving uh, in, in this fluid motion we talked about. Uh, you want to be big. You want to be able to keep your heat in. And you want to be able to hold on to your, uh, to your atmosphere. Impacts, a mixed blessing, ask the dinosaurs, it's not such a good thing, but it can import uh, building block organic uh, molecules, uh, it can provide habitats for uh, extremophiles, and it can make uh, satellites, and satellites can be important in terms of stabilizing climate zone for the uh, evolution of, uh, of uh, <coughs> higher forms of life, uh, drive tides that create Darwin pools to potentially um, uh, you know, provide an environment for the, uh, the nucleation of, of life itself. You want to have inherited from your solar nebula enough uh, long-lived radioactivities to, to keep the planet hot long enough for uh, a complex uh, life to, uh, to arise. You need this recycling mechanism, okay? On this planet, we call it plate tectonics, okay? We get to uh, reduce the CO2 that's emitted from uh, volcanic sources, whether it's uh, actually just uh, organic carbon is buried or in fact you, the URI reactions uh, create um, uh, 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 CO3 that, to, to, uh, that, that can be buried uh, geologically or recycled into the mantle. Uh, either way, uh, this is how we do it on, on this planet. And you'd like to have a geodynamo because it's going to help protect us from the rigors of space travel, it's going to help us hold on to, uh, to our atmosphere. So I give you this uh, simple primer, if only to point out that, in fact, uh, these ancient zircons uh, have an opinion about at least these uh, components of the, the, the ten ingredients for life. Okay. Now, obviously, there's a lot of complexity in how these ten uh, ingredients interact. I, this is one person, or my view, uh, of, you know, to, to visually evoke the, the complexity of these interactions. You're moving from, from left to right. Uh, how how these, uh, these various uh, ingredients can constructively or destructively uh, interact to lead to, uh, to, uh, to life. Uh, I mean, it's complex, yes, but as was uh, drawn, uh, <coughs> driven home to me, it's nowhere near as complex as uh, running a counterinsurgency in, uh, in the, uh, the, far, uh, the far Middle East. Okay, let's get down to the question of why are we talking about zircon. Okay, well, uh, zircon is, is great. It's, a, it's simply zirconium silicate. Um, so, you know, it's got zirconium, silicon, and oxygen. So we could anticipate the fact that the thing's two-thirds oxygen, we might be able to get some high-precision uh, oxygen isotope information out of it. Uh, zircon, in fact, has, as every mineral does, a little bit of everything uh, under the sun. Uh, it particularly likes heavy rare earths. It loves hafnium. We'll talk a little bit about that, not much. And uranium, thorium, and plutonium. Uh, you don't hear that much, uh, but in fact, four and a half billion years ago, there was... For every 100 uranium atoms uh, on Earth, there was one plutonium-244 atom, we think. And, uh, and of course, that's long, long since extinguished. It's gone by about 4.2 billion, billion years. But it left behind a signal that we can interrogate today. Now, some uh, elements, like titanium, in fact, are very rare in zircon at the PPM level. Turns out, the titanium and zircon has an opinion about the water content of the magma from which the, uh, the zircon formed. Uh, okay, so uh, lutetium up here decays to hafnium. You guys know this, uh, at least the geochemists here. And, uh, <clears throat> and zircon typically has one to, well, maybe even 2% hafnium. So we're going to be able to get a a snapshot from zircons, uh, even doing tiny little zircons, less than the width of one of the hairs on your head, we're going to be able to, in fact, get reasonably precise, sort of epsilon one part and 10 to the four uh, uh, isotope ratio precision uh, on that isotopic system. And when zircons form, they really don't like lead, okay? 
um, you know, at the, the part per billion level appears to be the, uh, the, the natural uh, uh, concentration of lead in a typical crustal, uh, 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 crystallizing from a typical crustal melt. Both uranium and thorium uh, decay to isotopes of lead. This is going to allow us to very precisely and accurately date these old zircons, these tiny little zircons, uh, to, oh, to better than a percent, typically. Okay, how are we going to do this? We're going to use a thing called an ion microprobe. Okay, it's got uh, three important parts, a source, uh, a mass and energy analyzer, and a collector. The, we make a beam of ions up here. We focus it down to, again, maybe it can be one fiftieth of the width of one of the hairs on your head. Polish sample down here, tiny little grains, uh, atoms <coughs> that interact with that primary ion beam. Some fraction are sputtered, knocked out. Some small fraction of those ionized. They see themselves in a 10,000 volt electric field. They get kicked into this mass analyzer that separates the isotopes, the, the, uh, the uh, ions into uh, uh, isotope streams. We can selectively analyze these and determine the uranium lead and the lead lead ages very precisely. Now in addition, I'll also point out later, this is a great device also to look at in situ uh, isotopes of carbon, for example. And I'll give you an example of how we do that uh, later on. And in, and, and in some cases, we can get adequately precise information per mil level information from uh, spots as small as about five microns. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, is race through what I think we've learned in the past 15 years or so from these old zircons. Okay, uh, first, oh, anyway, here's the outcrop in uh, Jack Hills, Murchison District of Western Australia. These are three billion year old uh, quartzites uh, <clears throat> of the zircon population, the detrital zircon population in these rocks. About 2% yield ages older than 4 billion years. Okay. And they get as old as virtually 4.4 billion years. So what have we learned? Well, if you look at the oxygen isotopes, as I mentioned, the uh, compared to Earth, and we'll use the moon as our, uh, as our metaphor here. This is typically uh, what you'd see in oxygen isotopes and zircons from, from the Earth's mantle. Uh, they're shifted to the right. They have heavy oxygen. There's more oxygen 18 in these uh, ancient zircons than you would find a zircon coming out of the mantle uh, today, for example. And the <coughs> explanation, the simplest explanation, is that this reflects clays in the source region of the magma, the, the, what melted to, in fact, eventually crystallize the zircon. And that's because clays can really strongly enrich uh, themselves in the heavy isotope of oxygen, oxygen 18 over, over 16. So this was suggestive enough. In fact, it was two groups. We published simultaneously the same issue of Nature back in 2001. And I mean, this can't be such a crazy idea that, you know, in fact, these two groups saw the same effect and came to the same conclusion. Eh, it's hardly smoking gun, but that's kind of where this started, which is eh, it's a little odd that you should see this, this heavy oxygen. That's what we associate today, or at least in Phanerozoic era, the last 542 million years heavy oxygen, isotope um, uh, enrichments in 18 in granitoid rocks signal the presence of metasedimentary uh, material in the source. Okay, the, to, to me, the strongest evidence we have came, comes from the development of this titanium and zircon thermometer, which, uh, in fact, when, we, the, when the thermometer uh, was developed, the first application was to the Hadean zircons, and indeed, that's what inspired the... Uh, the experimental calibration in the first place, what we found was this sort of bullet-like Gaussian from a large number, this is 70 or 80 uh, Hadean zircons, at a parent crystallization temperature of about 680 degrees. Now this, this is assuming uh, activity of rutile in the source of one. Uh, this could be shift uh, to the right, maybe 40 degrees or so if, uh, if the activity were 0.5, something like that. But just to keep things, um, to keep uh, a, a simple reference, Will, uh, will, will, and in fact, some zircons, some of these Hedian zircons have rutile inclusions in them. So at least for those ones, we're certain that the, uh, what the rutile activity in the 
the source melt was. Okay, um, that surprised us. That low temperature surprised us. Now, in addition, there actually, you know, every zircon, every zircon that I've ever encountered and uh, looked at in any detail, and we've uh, dated, we dated 200,000 zircons from this one out outcrop over the past uh, 18 years. Um, every zircon has inclusions in it, okay? Melt inclusions, mineral inclusions. And, and what we find in these Sedean zircons is if you can sort of see through later alteration effects, they come in two distinct flavors. One of kind of is like a, what we call a Cordieran assemblage, uh, ilmenite, hornblende, biotite, plagioclase, sort of what you'd see, you know, uh, erupting out of Mount St. Helens, okay? And the other is quartz, muscovite, feldspar, and rutile, which in fact looks like what you see in the Himalayan Luca granites. These are truly, clearly, purely intercrustal anatectic melts uh, that formed as a result of India colliding with Asia beginning about 55 million years ago. So this was, this was uh, distinctive. Now, muscovite, hornblende, and biotite, these are all hydrous phases. So this is, we're not inferring. I mean, there's clearly hydrous minerals in the, uh, the, in the magmas from which these things have formed. Now, in addition, the, the hornblende is it's a, a kind of ersatz geobarometer, uh, but the amount of silica content in white micas and muscovites, the selenite content, is a measure of pressure. And you can use a bunch of different barometers. But when we estimate the pressures, that turns out range from about, um, from about uh, 6 to 16 kilobars pressure. Well, we've got pressure and therefore an inferred depth. We've got temperature from the titanium thermometer. We can calculate a, a near surface geotherm, just assuming Fourier's law. These granites are going to for, be forming in a boundary, uh, thermal boundary layer. So we can assume that heat flow is, uh, is diffusive. Uh, and if you do that, the near surface ge geotherms are, are shown here. Now, what's really surprising about this is uh, you look at uh, models in the literature over the last 40 years estimating what the Hadean global average heat flow was, and they range from 200 to 400 milliwatts per square meter. Uh, the upper bound here at around 80 milliwatts, that's an interesting number because that's the present day global average heat flow. So wait a minute, you've got, you've got radioactivity is four or five times higher back then, there's a lot of primitive heat, hasn't yet escaped, and you're telling me that the heat flows are equal to or less than the present day. Well, the question to ask is where on the planet today do you make igneous rocks in a heat flow environment that's one third or one quarter of the global average? And there's only one place and you know what it is. Uh, they're called subduction zones, okay? Where the refrigerating effect of the downgoing slab suppresses the overall geotherm such that, that uh, if you look at you know, Mount St. Helens, day sites, the origin of the source of those things is 1,100 degrees at 75, 80 kilometers or something. Yeah, that turns out to be a heat flow apparently down here, okay? So uh, that led us to say, well, you know, these things seem to be a forming in a, a suppressed or in a, a surprisingly low heat flow environment. Could it be something like present day uh, underthrusting? Um, I'm not gonna talk much about this. Um, this is the lat lutetium hafnium isotope system I mentioned, uh, <clears throat> only to say that, that, uh, that this is how, if you took the earth, put it in a giant mortar and pestle and crushed it up and took a, an average sample, then through time from 4.5 billion years to the present day, you'd move along that line. Epsilon hafnium would be zero, the bulk earth. But you can see most of these zircons are plotting in the uh, negative quadrant. And this line here actually corresponds to the initial half mean 176, 177 ratio okay, of the solar system as it propagates through time. So these zircons up here, that zircon's 4.38 billion years, but it for all intents and purposes has Today, after I, we correct for in situ uh, radiogenic decay of, of lutetium, it has the initial solar system ratio. So th 
this has to have been separated. The source of that zircon has to have been separated from the, the global uh, bulk silicate Earth by 4.50 billion years, or we wouldn't see that plotting here. Okay, uh, I mentioned um, the plutonium. This is pretty cool. Uh, you got to thank the creator for this one. Uh, it turns out that if you plot in these three xenon isotopes where plutonium-244 fission is, where uranium-238 spontaneous fission is, and where uh, nucleogenic reactor-235 uh, fission is, it produces this beautiful uh, triangle. Uh, <coughs> this corresponds to uh, uranium-lead xenon age. Uh, the data in the red have lost xenon since they form. Okay? The ones in blue are with an uncertainty of being, you know, the uranium xenon age is the same as the uranium lead age, concordant zircons. Uh, if you plot down here, you had a uranium, a plutonium uranium ratio of zero. If you plot here, you have the full chondritic complement of plutonium uranium, value of about 0 0.01. So this is interesting. We get this range. Now, you can't magmatically really easily separate uranium from plutonium. They behave just too similarly, but you can uh, separate them in mildly oxidized aqueous fluids. So mm, is this more evidence that there was some water sloshing around back then? Dustin Trail did a nice job of, in fact, showing how you could use the uh, rare earth signatures in these zircons to estimate the uh, redox state. Uh, short, uh, long story short, uh, here's where the upper mantle plots up here, somebody where between about the uh, quartz phthalite magnetite buffer and magnetite hematite. Uh, but Hadean zircons, in fact, range from, you know, as oxidized as the upper mantle to orders of magnitude more reduced. Well, that's interesting because when you look at those Himalayan Luca granites, they've got rutile in them. Why did it? They're very reduced, and that's because there was reduced carbon. There was graphite in the source region, some, you know, some plant. Uh, uh, you know, that, uh, that died and decayed and uh, stayed in that metasediment that got buried in the Himalaya. Eventually, the underthrusting cooked those rocks up to 700, 730 degrees. There was nothing left of that carbonaceous material except graphite, and that's what buffered these things to these very low FO2. So we see a range from as oxidized as the present upper mantle to orders of magnitude more re reduced. The trace elements in the zircons they're uh, absolutely distinctive of continental zircons. Distinctive, I mean, zircon, there's zircons from the moon, there's zircons from eukrites, there's zircons from uh, Mars, there's a zircon from Mars. Uh, no, these are terrestrial continental granitic zircons. Well, <laughs> we had to take a single model to explain everything that we see. What is it? Well, the simplest explanation, I'm not saying it's correct, but the one model that actually explains everything that we see is that the planet looks then like it does today in its first order geodynamic regime. That there was something like plate boundary interactions occurring, that uh, there was something that would create reduced carbon, to, uh, in, in <clears throat> and there has to have, in fact, been uh, uh, some solid material, some stable crust that could, in fact, keep portions of the planet, of Earth, separated from the bulk silicate system since at least 4.50 billion years. Was there a magma ocean here at 4.45? I don't see how it's possible and, and not have remixed everything up. Simplest model. Now, I'm going to give a, uh, another primer on um, that's, you know, sort of your third year petrology. Class, I think this is really important because, uh, as I mentioned, I believe the thermometry, the zircon thermometry, is the uh, strongest piece of evidence we have for uh, this model. And that is that water in the crust below just, you know, a few kilometers, it isn't in grain boundaries, it isn't in porosity. By the time you get down to about 15 kilometers depth, the porosity is a tenth of a percent. Uh, permeabilities are, you know, 10 to the minus 15 meters squared or, or, or lower. Water is actually held in, uh, typically, these, well, in, for the most part, in these three minerals, muscovite, biotite, and hornblende, okay? Now, interestingly, above about middle crustal pressures, 
15, 5 kilobars, 15, 18 kilometers depth. You can see that a silicate melt, regardless of composition, can dissolve an immense amount of water, like you know, 60 mole percent water. Uh, so if we, in fact, want to water saturate a, uh, a granitoid or a, any kind of granite in the middle or, 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 or deep crust, you're going to need a semi-infinite reservoir of molecular water to, to do this, okay? Um, again, apologies for showing you a, a phase diagram, but I think um, these folks uh, did a, a real public service by, in fact, showing here's pressure, temperature. This is the wet granite solid. This is the where the water saturated uh, melting of, in this case, a uh, politic uh, uh, meta, uh, metapelite, uh, a shale, if you'd like. But in fact, if we were to put a basalt up here or we were to put up a granite, it wouldn't look a whole lot different. Okay, so you can only, you can get melt here at 660 degrees and 10 kilobars, but only if you've got these extraordinary amounts of, uh, of, of water present. Now, they, they say the public service thing was showing this, the effect of solidus. Okay, because this defines the boundary between less than 3% melt and greater, 10%, 20%, 30%, and so on. And my point is when we look, we've got PT data on those old zircons, they plot in essentially the melt-free zone. You look at a thin section of a granite, of a, of a rock that's got 3% melt, you won't notice it's there. Okay, so you're certainly not going to mobilize 3% uh, of a viscous granitic melt in, in any sort of protolith that you're likely to find on this planet. So what this is screams at me is that we have to have been at or close to water saturation uh, in the source regions to create the granitoids that eventually crystallized these zircons. Now we can move this over 40 or 50 degrees depending on um, on uh, assumed rutile activity for that thermometer, but for the zircons that have rutile inclusions, they're stuck here. Okay, so let's um, let's 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 press ahead. Um, first, let's talk about how I don't think this happened. There's lots of opinions, lots of. In fact, it's interesting. There, as time uh, evolves, there are in fact more and more. Uh, models of, of, of how you might explain these old zircons. The first one was, okay, well, you've got these depressed geotherms, fair enough, but subduction is not the only way to make that. What about sagduction, where you, in fact, uh, basically, here's some uh, thick uh, basaltic crust uh, that doesn't become neutrally buoyant because it's so thick, it thickens up and eventually it's gonna get hot enough down here that you'll partially melt. Well, that's true, but where's the source of semi-infinite reservoir of water that we need. What you're going to have in this rock down here is whatever got trapped in the pore space, less than a tenth of a percent, so less than you know, 0.05 um, weight percent water. So that ain't going to help you. And, uh, and even if you have 50% muscovite in your rock, that's only 2% water. So that rock's going to melt at 900, 910 degrees, okay? It won't make a zircon until it cools down because uh, you know, zirconium is going to be infinitely soluble in the melt of that, uh, that composition then. But what you'd expect to see, as, you'll, uh, as you will see, is temperatures of 850, 780, 750 degrees, something like that. Okay, so uh, another suggestion, well, maybe Earth had a creep-like layer, for those of you not... Uh, tuned into uh, long-standing lunar uh, uh, petrology. The idea was that there was a magma ocean on the moon. It crystallized, left a plagioclase flotation residue, residue that made the, the highlands. And because there's all these incompatible elements that didn't want to go into a feldspar crystal, you had this enriched potassium, rare earth, phosphorus uh, rich, uh, zirconium rich uh, layer. Um, so here's the early Earth. We've got this creepy thing. Uh, we have an atmosphere out here. And that's actually one interesting thing is that you'll notice that all these models assume that there's an atmosphere and a hydrosphere. So if one thing the old zircons have united us in is the view that as early as 4.38 billion years, there was water at or near the Earth's surface in one, one form or another. Okay, so then you get buried down here and uh, eventually there's some, uh, some meltings occurring and you make these little melts 
um, uh, notice that they're sort of not pluton size, but uh, the Jack Hill zircons are forming in here. Well, I would dispute that in fact, a, you know, three percent melting, you will uh, segregate a granite melt. Um, but even if you did, what's the characteristic that the zircons are going to be 750, 800, 850 degree titanium temperatures? Because there's simply no source of quasi-infant source of, of okay. Um, uh, impacts. Um, <coughs> here's a, a, a recent, a relatively recent paper. Oh, boom, boom. It's like in the, in the moon. Impacts came in smack, smack. And you basically had impact craters in which the impact melt spilled over the edges of the crater and basically started to pile up. And as you pile up, eventually things will get hot. You'll melt that pile. Same problem. Uh, you'll, uh, you've, there's just simply <laughs> no way you're going to be able to channel uh, uh, 60 or 70 mole percent water into those melts that are happening at, at great depths. Now, you know, not only that, but in fact, we went to the trouble of going and finding uh, impact melts on this planet, last 2.2 billion years, Sudbury, Manicowagan, Papagai, uh, Sudbury, Berkwang. And when you look at the uh, zircons from the impact melts, do they look like the Jack Hills? Uh, no, they in fact look like Zircons forming from mafic rocks, 750, 780 uh, degrees on, on average. So whatever else these Sidian zircons are, they, their impacts are not contributing a significant uh, a portion to. Uh, uh, heat pipe, uh, former colleagues, uh, Bill Moore, Alex Webb, said, well, you know, you look at Io and you see all that volcanism, the surf, sulfur boiling out as a result of tidal interactions with the nearby giant planet. Uh, what if this happened? What if Earth was so hot that the before stagnant lid, before plate tectonics, in fact, we lost heat the same way? You basically just shot molten rock out to the surface. It plated on the outside. Heat reflects into outer space, and you just bury the surface. That's going to create a low geotherm. Again, where's the water coming from? Now, in fact, notice that they're, they're serious. They're burying things down 100, 150 kilometers. Why? Because a report in, um, oh, about 10 years ago, I guess, from a German West Australian group found uh, diamonds in these Hadean zircons. And in fact, they looked at about 30 Hadean zircons and found diamonds in, 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 in several of them, many of them. Uh, and they found um, carbonaceous uh, materials of, of, of other, other kinds. And so the uh, uh, Bill and, uh, and Alec said, okay, well, in fact, we'll use that as a constraint. We have to bury in order to make these dive. Now, I was, well, the group was puzzled because at that point, this, these folks had looked at about 30 Hadean zircons. At that point, we looked at 1,750 uh, Hadean zircons for their inclusion assemblage, and we had seen diamonds in none of them. Okay, and it turns out uh, that, in fact, there was a difference between our samples and theirs, and of course it was that uh, we didn't use 30 micron diamond paste when we polished ours, and, uh, and these folks did. But you know, that, um, that begs the question, which is, well, okay, there are no diamonds in these old zircons, but what is the actual rate of occurrence of carbonaceous materials in the Hadean zircons? And um, my grad students at the time, Patrick Bunka, who in fact you hosted here, I think a month or so ago, and, and uh, Bethann Bell, undertook an, ex an amazing uh, uh, pro project where they, in fact, examined a very large number of zircons, found zircons with opaque inclusions, used Raman spectroscopy to identify uh, uh, reduced carbon materials, and they found, ooh, I guess I've lost my animation. Uh, no, I haven't. No, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. So, okay, now actually, let me, let me take a step back. That's what this is. This is, you know, I'm sorry if, if this is sort of overly elementary, but, you know, the, the range, of, range of disciplinary talent here, I thought I'd just point out how it is that we know when life began or when different kinds of uh, biologic uh, activity was occurring. And, of course, the, since the Cambrian uh, Proterozoic boundary, we've, we've, you know, the Cambrian biodiversity explosion has given us a fantastic high resolution way to subdivide uh, the, the Phanerozoic, right? You, you know, here's a trilobite. We simply, you know, we can, we can constrain the age of this bed here by, in fact, dating this 
uh, unconfirmed. This granite that's unconformably cut, we get a lower bound. Um, we can there, date this dike here that cross cuts the sediment which is in. There's an upper bound, so we can constrain when that trilobite uh, lived, uh, you know, about uh, 450 to 425 million years ago. Now, things get complicated as we go, as we go back. Now we're in the Precambrian. There's no macroscopic fossils, but there are microfossils, like this is Gunflint, I think. Um, you know, that's uh, maybe about um, 50 microns across. And uh, what's interesting is if you analyze the carbon isotope composition of this little critter, um, in fact, rests in the field of delta carbon 13 of about minus 25. Now, why is that interesting? Well, if you look at in organic carbon, if you look at carbonate carbon over the past three and a half billion years, because remember we've got low grade sediments, at least that old, and they average about zero. But th this organic goo called kerogen, what we think were in fact, or, you know, or the, the remnants uh, hasn't quite turned into petroleum. But uh, the, um, it, when you look at long term compilations like that, you can see that in fact, uh, organic material is averaging about minus 25 over the past 25 years. So this was, in fact, uh, an inspiration when we got our first uh, ion microprobe to, to, in fact, try and use this observation to, uh, to explore the question of when life might have emerged. So here we are. We're in um, uh, southwest Greenland. This on the island of Achillea. There's this little peninsula sticks out. I'll show you this. Here's a, a, a rather crude sketch map. This is this uh, meta <coughs> sedimentary supercrustal enclave amongst a bunch of gneisses. You can see here these folks thought that there was this cross-cutting uh, uh, granitoid uh, dike here dated at 3.8 billion. Well, this meta chert here, what's interpreted as a meta chert, sits in this package cut by that 3.8 billion year dike. Ah, if we can find reduced carbon here, is it is it Carbon isotope signature zero? Is it minus 70? Is it, what, it, what is it? Um, we went back and actually mapped it in some detail. One interesting thing is that, I don't know what these guys were, were smoking, but there ain't no uh, big uh, uh, dike cross-cutting here. Fortunately, there actually is another uh, uh, tonalite dike that cross-cuts up here that we've dated 3.83 billion years. So the green rocks are this meta shirt here. I'll show it to you. It's uh, banded. It's been. Uh, it's actually been intruded by a uh, sort of peroxynite um, uh, veinlets uh, later. Uh, here's the uh, here's the meta. What's interpreted as the meta chert here, and inside big chunks of quartz, there are little apatite crystals. Okay, calcium phosphate stuff. The enamel your teeth's made out of it. And inside here, this one's been been etched with nitric. You see these little. 5, 10, 15 micron blobs of, of, of graphite. Now, these rocks have been up to granulite grade at least twice. They're, they're, you're not going to see anything with little horns or a tail. This is what, this is what you know, a microbiotic creature would look like uh, after that, that history. Well, um, here's, the, here's the quartz in, uh, in pink, the apatite shown here using uh, Raman imaging. Here's a graphite crystal here. Um, when you, in fact, polish these, you can identify these things completely enclosed, no cracking, uh, and you analyze the uh, carbon isotopic composition of the graphite, it comes out at you know, essentially uh, minus 25, minus, minus 30. So the thought would be maybe this is evidence that you know, there were bugs on the planet at 3.83. This was not um, well received because the lore was that, no, no, that's the peak of the late heavy bombardment. There's no way that you know, animals could, uh, you know, even microbiota uh, could, have, could have survived. So, in fact, uh, we, Beth Ann and Patrick, after an absolutely Herculean uh, survey, found a zircon um, that contains uh, two uh, graphite um, uh, 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 inclusions in it. You can see the sort of quasi-hexagonal uh, uh, crystal habit. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I have, I do, I've got a movie. We uh, took this up to Wendy Mao at Stanford and ran this on the, uh, um... no, nope. oh, it is, <laughs> I have to see. Okay, let's do it again. Okay, so yeah, so here's on the spindle. There's, there's the two inclusions, um, you know, 
crack free you can't there's no you know there's no plane with uh, you know bubble trains that suggest that this is a, a healed crack this is about as prima facie evidence you'd have of the carbon in fact being uh, armored being included in the zircon from crystallization at 4.1 billion years and guess what the composition is it's it's minus 24 and uh, Patrick may have in fact have talked a bit about this uh, we have subsequently we have three more examples of zircons with uh, graphite inclusions in them. We um, uh, we we haven't yet uh, isotopically uh, analyzed them, uh, but um, but you know I'm 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 not here to to suggest that we have a um, smoking gun evidence that there was you know bugs on this planet at 4.1 billion years, but What's absolutely clear from the, the you know, extraordinary uh, uh, labor-intensive study of Patrick and Beth Ann's is that we have a path forward. Do we want to know what the carbon isotope budget on this planet was through the Hadean? Uh, we can do this. It's going to take an extraordinary effort, very coordinated, I think, globally, because we estimate that we're going to need to have... Uh, oh, 10 million zircons dated to do this. If we want to come up with a thousand Hadean carbonaceous inclusions, given the statistics we have, which are obviously of small numbers, um, 10 million um, dated Hadean zircons could give us a, a, a thousand carbonaceous inclusions. And you know, the results could, in fact, well, what if the results show? nicely the probability distribution of carbonaceous chondrites. Okay, well, then I'll be the first to admit that we're not looking at biologic activity. Uh, we just accidentally, the first one we measured, ended up way out on the, uh, the tail, uh, the light tail of, uh, of that distribution. Um, what if, in fact, there is a bump at minus 25, there's a bump at minus 40, there's a bump at minus 75, Oh, could this be methanogenesis? Could this be the acetyl-CoA pathway? Could this be the Calvin cycle that we're looking at? Um, so, in a sense, uh, we don't know where we're going. Uh, it, it, this is actually called exploration. And as you can imagine, it's not well thought of in uh, federal funding agency circles because I've tried now uh, four times on two different continents. And the uh, response is always the same, which is, uh, well, I should say that what, we, what we're proposing is not to, it's to get away from Jack Hills. There are 13 other locations on the planet where zircons older than the oldest known rock uh, on the planet uh, are, are found. Uh, let's, let's, I mean, if, if in fact it turns out that Jack Hills is the only one that gives the 680 degree peak, well, I guess, in fact, this was a local phenomena. What if they all do? Um, so I say there's a consistency argument that um, that that uh, is, is really all we have. But um, you know we've gone looking for samples from other planets with a whole lot less uh, scientific motivation than than that. So um, anybody that's here, say especially you know younger folks that are starting out, uh, this is um, this is a. I mean I would I would put the goals of that of this project. Uh, co-equal to any planetary mission that NASA is currently uh, planning. And uh, we could do this for 7% of the cost. <laughs> okay, so like you can read that faster than I can repeat it. So why don't you think up some tough questions and, uh, and get stuck into me. Thanks. carbon isotope signature, does that require photosynthesis or can autotrophic process and make it? It just so happens that oxygen photosynthesis would plot right there. So, uh, but, you know, could it be, as I say, there's any number, there's a spectrum of, of metabolic uh, me mechanisms that this could be an average of inorganic carbon and methanogenesis. Does 
Does anybody know what the signature is for deep sea hydrothermal? Uh, it must be known. I, I... Um, yeah, and in fact, there's there's a couple of, well, one uh, uh, example I know where what appears to be an inorganic uh, mechanism, the Fischer Trove type synthesis, may have produced something very similar to this to this value. Um, now that said, uh, the Fischer Trove requires that you have uh, you know um, you know metallic iron or something present. Uh, this is not likely in, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a granitoid zircon <laughs> with, a, with a continental trace element uh, signature. It's hard to imagine uh, that you've got, uh, you know, um, you know uh, a QFM type, uh, you know, read or oxygen, uh, 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 oxygen fugacity signature coexisting with uh, with iron metal. Yep. I wonder if you could break up your massive effort into a couple of stages. You've got two um, things that you're looking at here. One is to determine whether these four billion year old zircons form in water saturated environments under low heat flow. And that seems like a larger population of the zircons should indeed show that. Whereas uh, trying to look for the carbon, you're, you're, you're having to look at a, a whole lot of them. So, of the 13 other, or the 12 other places other than the Jack Hills, um, how many of those have been looked at to look at the um, water solubility and pressure temperature conditions? Uh, there's been no, um, not one of those 13 locations, there have been more than uh, 2,000 uh, detrital zircons looked at. And remember, typically, uh, Jack Hills is a mine, it's 2%. Uh, there's a paper uh, I'm reviewing. Uh, where people have found uh, the 13th location in uh, southern Africa, and there it's 0.05 percent. So, uh, so uh, you know, do the arithmetic. So, no more than a dozen or two older zircons have been found, and only one other, only at Mount Nerier, which is not far from Jack Hills, has has that uh, the, ge the geochemical analysis been done the titanium concentration, the rare earth behavior, the half meme, and so on. So uh, when I talk about the 10 million zircons, uh, every one of those uh, Hadean zircons, and let's, let's say that there, you know, there, there turns out to be 10,000 of them, uh, they would all, in fact, then first be characterized geochemically. So we would know what the titanium temperature is, and we would know what the redox state, and so on. And, that, and, the, and on the way to identify the opaque inclusions and eventually the reduced carbon. So the effort is just finding these things more than anything else. Yeah, but you know, I, and it's true. I mean, I would, you know, I'll be, I'll be interested to see if everything looks like was water saturated granite melting, but that pales in comparison to, I mean, somebody tell me what a more important unresolved scientific question than when did life emerge on earth? Anybody? Uh, I can't. I can't think of anything that I would like to know more. <laughs> yeah. Can you um, elaborate a little bit more on the uranium plutonium story and how that cycle worked? Oh, yeah, a little bit. A little bit. Um, yeah, the um, you know uranium uh, has two. Oxidation states uh, plus four plus six, and you know, it, and 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 you can get the uranyl. You can get the plus six state with very just a, a breath of uh, ten to the minus forty bars of FO two. In fact, will 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 uh, you know in in a pH four uh, aqueous fluid give you the uranyl state. So so uranium can be mobile just as soon as you look at it, but None of the six valent states of plutonium uh, can you do you have a, uh, a species that's uh, that's uh, potentially you know as as soluble in aqueous fluid. So, so I got that far. I guess what I was trying to get was just a little bit of a better picture of how you what what sort of environment you envision that data pointing to. Oh, is, I think is it pointing to something that is. Surface environment. Yes. Yeah. So, so let's say that there's no no molecular water 
at or near the Earth's surface at 4.2 billion years, then what I would expect is to see a zircon with essentially chondritic plutonium uranium because there's no because you'd have to fraction you'd have to in fact put that thing through 40 uh, Bowen's reaction cycles in order to to uh, uh, get a plutonium uranium ratio of zero, but in one cycle in the presence of a slightly uh, oxidized uh, aqueous fluid, you could strip the uranium right out. So I'm not a detrital zircon person. You just uh, told us that uh, the proportion of Hadean zircons to non-Hadean zircons varies quite a bit. Could you give us a, a little overview of uh, what dictates that proportion? And uh, yeah. in terms of provenance of the zircons, does any portion of the rock that uh, the zircon is eroded from end up in the stuff that you sample in Western Australia? Well, yeah, they, so, so the, the, the joy of the zircon is that we've got this beautiful little, you know, um, armoring device that we can date accurately. Now, it might have been that the muscovite crystal that grew right next to it is sitting next to it in the uh, sedimentary uh, rock, the three billion year old sedimentary rock. But, you know, uh, uh, there's no way I can date that muscovite to, to tell me about something that happened 4.2 billion years ago. So we're at the. We now, on the other hand, remember that horn blend in the biotite that was inside that 4.2 billion year old? That I can tell you. So if, if you want to expand your definition of what a rock, right? A rock is a naturally occurring, you know, multi-mineralic. Well, maybe what that zircon is, is a micro rock encapsulation system. And that's a very tiny little rock that consists of muscovite, quartz, rutile, and, and feldspar. And in which case, I can show you a Hadean uh, uh, rock. Now, what's interesting is when you look at well-constrained Phanerozoic cases, where you've got, you know, where we can identify zircon inclusions in rocks in, intact, uh, the, the, the inclusion assemblage is not directly um, uh, relatable in terms of modal abundances to, to the rock as a whole, because the zircons are forming, you know, especially at 600 degrees, these zircons are forming just before the whole system uh, crystallized. So, you know, there isn't a one-to-one -one relationship between the micro rocks that we're seeing in the zircons. I think to your broader question is, uh, is, is what are the preservation biases? That, that interestingly, we don't see Hadean zircons with more than about 400 ppm uranium. You go to your favorite, you know, Piedmont granite, and, uh, you know, and you look at, there'll be zircons that have 200, 300, 400. There'll be zircons that have 1,000, and there'll be a couple that have, you know, 3,000 ppm. We don't see them, and why not? Because nature took care of them, okay? They were, they were so radioactive, there was so much uranium and thorium, they basically turned themselves into jelly. They became metamict and couldn't survive this. I mean, this is a very mature sediment. This is a pure quartz quartzite these things are coming from. So nature, in fact, has already prejudiced, biased the population. Now, what's interesting, when you look at those Phanerozoic zircons, um, do we see a relationship between formation temperature and uranium concentration? Yeah, we do. Okay, because, in fact, those high uranium zircons are the last ones to crystallize because the incompatible uranium and thorium have, in fact, you know, been waiting around for, for something to swallow them up. So could this explain our bullet-like galaxy at 680 degrees? No, that mechanism works exactly the opposite direction, that the lowest temperature zircons are the ones that, in fact, are missing from the record, the high uranium zircons. So if anything, we have a, a record that's biased towards high temperature preservation, zircon preservation. I want to follow up on that. So none of your Hadean zircons are metamic? Well, um, the, the, the ones that we have been able to, I mean, remember, we treated this rock pretty violently. We, we, we shipped it across the ocean, we crushed it, we put it through a pulverizer, and. So, you know, what survived are the, the zircons that had enough crystalline integrity. Uh, when you look at them, when you look at them with, you know, Raman, uh, you know, they can, they can, you know, they can vary, they can have uh, some degree of, uh, of radiation damage. 
um, you know, maybe be sort of you know, 90 percent crystalline zircon somewhere on that scale. But other ones are, for all intents and purposes, pure crystalline zircon. What would the effect of any degree of, of radiation damage have on the uranium lead age? Um, you re really have to. Um, you really have to recrystallize. You have to uh, essentially turn the zircon into jelly. Okay, you know, zirconium silicate jelly, and then uh, heat it up before. And when you do that. You'll expel all the goodies. You'll expel the, uh, the t titanium, and you'll expel the cerium, and you'll expel all these things that don't want to be in there. Uh, and we see that in the population. Interestingly enough, despite you know any statement I made that's skeptical of the late heavy bombardment, the, the only zircons in the Jack Hills population where you see that bimodal, where you see evidence of thermal um, recrystallization is between 3.82 and 3.94 billion years. So I'm not saying the LHB didn't happen. I'm saying that maybe we've been using the wrong planetary body to, in fact, uh, uh, you know, uh, to use as a record of, of, of that event. <laughs> maybe that's a good place to stop. Oh. I just, I just had one follow, one follow yeah, just a follow-up on, on hmm. Jay's question. Thinking about the zircons that are surviving, the ones that have turned to jelly and disappeared, you, you, there presumably is a way to consider at what point, at what uranium level would one predict for the zircons to disappear? And then there's a uranium level, a maximum level of uranium that's observed. Have, have you gone through that thought experiment? Well, it's, it's it complicated up, because the only thing we know is that the zircons have all shared the same thermal history the last three billion years. Okay, and a zircon, if you heat a zircon up to, you know, relatively, uh, you know, sort of depths corresponding relatively really shallow levels in the crust, 200 degrees, you'll anneal all that radiation damage. So all we know is that all those zircons have had the same, but we don't know what happened in the previous 1.4 billion years. Uh, the ones that in fact were kept hot, they'll have been perfectly crystallized at 3 billion years. And if they've got less than 400 ppm, yeah, you wouldn't expect them to be, to be metamaked. Yeah. Last question. So, if you want to put something number two on your list of important questions to answer, the first being when did life originate on this planet? The second one might be when did uh, South Pole Aiken Basin form on the moon? That's kind of a key to uh, many of these questions. Was it 3.9 or was it 4.9? Oh, yeah, I don't think anybody thinks it was 3.9. I mean, uh, right. Um, I don't know. That, that, I mean, you know, as people. big a skeptic as I am, I wouldn't bring it down that late. I, you know, my, but anyway, but I would mention to the grad students over lunch that um, a chap named Harrison had done a calculation 15 years ago. Maybe some of you are aware of this, where it was like, you know, geez, the moon was 13 times closer, things were smacking in, and so there would have been a lot of terrestrial debris actually. Um, you know, uh, uh, deposited on the, in the lunar highlands and you know, been through the gardening over four and a half, four billion years or so. And what was interesting, the calculation is if you take the Jack Hills, right? That's our Hadean zircon mine. There's 100 ppm zirconium in that rock, so 50 ppm zircon, if that's where all the zirconium is. Only 2% are, uh, are Hadean, so it's less than one ppm. His calculation is that the average lunar highland has got between 50 and 80 times more terrestrial Hadean zircons in it than we have in our Hadean zircon mine from Western Australia. So I'm a big booster. If we want to understand early Earth, let's go to the moon. I'm happy to hear you. <laughs> <laughs> um, on that note, let's, let's thank Mark one last time. Thanks.